Hey there. One note before we start, just a warning that this episode includes some graphic descriptions of human remains. Okay, here's the show. So what, what building was this? Anatomy lab. So this was the anatomy lab? Yeah, well, this office was the dean of students' office. And... Uh, in the back was the anatomy department office and a gross anatomy laboratory. Just a few hundred feet from the most famous beach in Grenada is a rundown one story building. Last year, I stood outside of it with senior producer Ted Muldoon and Dr. Robert Jordan. Oh boy, lots of good memories here. It's the old abandoned anatomy lab of St. George's University, or SGU. That is the name of the medical school that I mentioned in the last two episodes, the one that a lot of Americans went to and still do. The school built a new lab on a different campus back in the 90s. But we really wanted to see this lab, and we wanted to see it with Dr. Jordan. Uh, We'll take a short tour of the uh, overgrown and decaying building, but it's still here. You're going to hear me refer to him as Dr. Jordan because that's what everybody calls him. He's not, in fact, a medical doctor. He's actually a PhD. He's a retired professor who taught at SGU for 40 years. And he used to work in this building. When we got there, one of the doors was open, so we just went inside. Oh, good. Inside, there was broken furniture everywhere. There were leaks in the ceiling, there were stacks of textbooks with moldy pages. Wow. Be careful. Oh, I'm not going in there. On the ground were all these little black pellets that I thought at first might have come from mice, until I realized, oh no, not mice. Those are bats. Bats. <laughs> It's hard to picture now, but this is where Dr. Jordan used to teach medical students human anatomy. They used cadavers brought in from the States. This is the first room of the uh, section lab, and then just beyond that door where that crap is, is the second room. I asked Dr. Jordan to bring us here because of what I'd heard had taken place in this lab in November of 1983 a forensic exam led by the U.S. military. Dr. Jordan had been a part of it. They they would have come through that door? Yeah. Which room was the exam done in? Those out there. So, not to belabor things, but like when the army brought those body bags, you would have carried them on gurneys or on... I think they just carried them, period, uh, by by body bags, and then put them on the tables, like uh, the gross tables on the other side. Dr. Jordan was one of the few people who was in the room for that examination. And I wanted to know what he saw, who he thought those remains belonged to, whether he thought that they might have been the remains of Maurice Bishop and the rest of the group of people killed with him. But then he started to describe what he saw. And it brought up a lot of other questions for me about how exactly the remains got to his lab and what happened before they got there. From the Washington Post, I'm Martine Powers, and this is The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. Episode 4. In the days after the U.S. invasion of Grenada, at least 700 Americans were evacuated from the island. Most of them were students at SGU or other people connected to the school. Dr. Jordan was one of the few who decided to stay. Before he showed us around his old lab, we sat with him in a conference room on SGU's newer campus. This is about a 10-minute drive from the old lab, and it's basically a different world. 
It looks like a resort, a bunch of pristine, matching buildings with terracotta roofs. Test, 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 test. You're not recording. I'm just, I'm just setting your levels real quick. <laughs> Dr. Jordan had brought a folder with him to the conference room. It had documents and photos and his day planner from 1983. Wow, I mean, okay. everything in there, uh, yeah. none of which is important to you except the, the couple days or a couple of weeks of... Uh, oh my gosh. Of of hearing. And I can, I can have that? Oh. And we asked him to bring us back to that time, to 1983, and to explain to us why he didn't evacuate with the rest of the Americans. He told us about the moment he had to make that decision. He was helping to shuttle students who lived off campus over to one of the main dorms. That was the meeting point, where they were going to be helicoptered away by U.S. Army Rangers. We hear the fighting, and there's some artillery shells falling. I run in and I see a good, great student uh, of ours who is guarding the door of the dorm. I run in and say, well, I'm going to stay here. I have no reason to go home. And in fact, he had a reason to stay. He needed to take care of Brandy, a dog that belonged to his friend. The dog is a German Shepherd mix. She's pregnant. I don't think the dog would be allowed to go anywhere when you get evacuated. I'm going to stay. By the way, Brandy later gave birth to nine puppies. But it wasn't just about the dog. Dr. Jordan, before he switched careers, was a mechanic in the Air Force. So he wanted to stay to see the action. I was having a good time. I'm sorry. I'm so in the military. I was having a good time. And then there was a third reason to stay behind. His lab. Dr. Jordan was responsible for the cadavers. There had been power outages during the invasion, and he needed to get the generator up and running to keep the cadavers preserved. So he stayed. The thing is, after the evacuations, fighting was still going on near the campus. So Dr. Jordan and Brandy, the very pregnant dog, at one point they had to hide in his gross anatomy lab to escape the shooting. We run to the gross lab, run to the door, go to my office, get under the desk, and as soon as we get under the desk, you know, there's all sorts of fighting, a terrible racket. The two buildings right across the street from us they get bombed, and the explosion blows out the windows over us. Oh, my gosh. Whew. Whew. Sorry. No, it's an intense memory. Take your time. Wow. I've said this story so many times, but I don't get that this choked up. Anyway... <clears throat> It blows the window out, so we, oh, I said, oh, shoot. <clears throat> and I walk out in the hallway. The gross lab's there. We're in the office. To recap, the U.S. invaded Grenada on October 25th. After three days, the fighting was mostly over. So by November of 1983, Dr. Jordan was kicking around a mostly empty campus. He was helping clean up after all the chaos of the invasion. We had no power all that time, so uh, everything in the dorms had gone bad. So I helped the crews clean all the refrigerator stuff out, which was rotten turkeys. And then he can't remember definitively how he heard about what happened next, but he thinks maybe another professor called him. They called and said, we're bringing some bodies over. The Army wants to look at some bodies. Uh, Can we use your gross lab? There were at least two sets of people who came to Dr. Jordan's lab. We think the first was a group of soldiers from the Army's Graves Registration Service. This was the military unit in charge of dealing with human remains. They had exhumed the bodies at Calabini. The second was a team from an agency known back then as the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Basically, they were forensic experts sent from the U.S. They were not in Grenada when the bodies were exhumed. They actually flew in from D.C. two days later to perform the autopsy. And this forensic team, it was made up of five men. Were they um, around your age, much older, much younger? They were older men then. I mean, uh, then I was 42, 43. And you think they were mostly older than you? Yeah. They were in their 60s. Uh, The photographer was younger. Uh, The guys who hauled the bodies in were younger. The job of the forensic team was to identify who was in the body bags, Dr. Jordan told us the staff at the school were whispering about it. The caretaker, I mean, all of them, my groundsmen who there said, oh, it's, it probably got Bishop in there, probably got Bishop in there, probably got, you know, Jackie in there. 
Jackie referring to Jacqueline Kreft, the Minister of Education. There's all sorts of theories out there, as you know. In Dr. Jordan's memory, four body bags were brought in. They were placed on the metal tables his students used for dissections. Then the forensic team opened up the bags. And a heads up that you're about to hear some descriptions that are pretty graphic, but it's important to be clear about what they were dealing with. The bodies weren't recognizable bodies anymore. They were more like body parts. Formally, they would later be described as, quote, commingled remains in a state of advanced decomposition. Dr. Jordan described seeing shredded, burnt, rotting flesh. His lab assistant, Christopher Belgrave, who died recently, was also there. Dr. Jordan says that he and Belgrave, they looked at the frantic team and said, We, we can't do anything because they're full of maggots. Let's, let's spray this stuff tonight and come back tomorrow on the 11th, and let's, let's look at them then, if you don't mind. So Belgrave and I spent, oh, gosh, three hours, four hours that night, spraying, respraying, spraying, and I saw it in all the bodies. So, so that was before they were even pulled out of the bags? You just we kept didn't pull them out. There's nothing to pull out. There was nothing to pull out. The next morning, the forensic team started to search through the remains in the bags. They were looking for anything that could help make an identification. Dr. Jordan offered his assistance, and they said, sure. So he got in there. You have to sift with your hands and feel everything. So you're moving, you're feeling, you're sifting, reading, seeing anything that's just a bone that's hard. So they just, you just had everything laid out, and everyone's just sort of looking at it. Well, it was in a pile. It wasn't laid out. They found bones. They found two bullets. The search went on for several hours. And the photographer was there also taking pictures of things. There wasn't much talking, though. We had very little interaction. If I found something, I would say, hey, here's, what do you think about this? And they say, oh, we clean it up and uh, you know, look at it and put it on the table. But we didn't discuss whose it was at the time and who to be looking for. Dr. Jordan's not a forensic scientist. His professional expertise is not in bodies that have experienced this level of trauma and decay. But as an anatomy professor, he has spent most of his life looking around the insides of bodies. And a few things stuck out to him. First, it seemed like there was a lot that was missing. From what Dr. Jordan could tell, the bones that they were finding weren't nearly enough to make up the full skeletons of eight people. His best guess was that these bones came from five people. And those bones were seriously damaged. There were no, very few intact bones. Uh, The long bones, most of the long bones were splintered and burned. He wondered to himself if the remains had been chopped up or crushed or run over in some way, maybe even dynamited. I see crushed runes, uh, and in all the bones that I found, the long bones, were splintered and blackened. Tells me they were grenaded or dynamited. There were no grenade fragments in there, so they were dynamited, in my mind. That's my, my impression. We do know that if these were the remains of Maurice Bishop and the others, they had been machine gunned at the fort. So that could have accounted for at least some of the damage that Dr. Jordan saw. But there was another thing that was even harder to account for. After looking through all the contents of the body bags, Dr. Jordan remembers that the team could only find a few pieces of skulls. No heads. Very few heads. What heads, what head pieces over there didn't match five bodies. The fact that these remains had only fragments of skull bones, that was obviously very strange to him. It also made things a lot harder for the forensic team because they were trying to figure out whose bodies these were. They'd been hoping to use dental records to help make those identifications. But almost no skulls meant almost no teeth. There was only one set of teeth found and another part of a jaw fragment with one tooth. What made the job even harder was that back in 1983, DNA wasn't yet used by forensic scientists to help make identifications. So the fragments of bones were all this team had to go off of. 
Under ideal circumstances, scientists can use the bones they find to help estimate the height and sex of the person they belong to. But in this case, the bones were so broken up, it was challenging. Dr. Jordan had known Maurice Bishop. They'd met at cocktail parties at the university. So Dr. Jordan knew that he was quite tall, about 6'3". And Bishop's height, it was a factor in how these broken up bones were being assessed. And we could judge from the, what was there, the size of the bone. So if you have a humerus that's this long, we can then from the size of the humerus tell how long it was. Bar femur, the femurs were cut, burned, but by the piece over there we could tell how long it was. So the experts came to a conclusion in the room. No one represented in the bone fragments was over the height of 6'1", two inches shorter than Bishop. None of those bones were long enough to be Bishop's. This is important. If Bishop was not in those remains, that raises a whole bunch of other questions about what did happen to his body, whether it might have been separated out at some point. There was another detail that stuck out to Dr. Jordan, too, a particular bone that he noticed. The pelvises, there were three pelvises, four, three and a half pelvises, they were whole, but they were kind of charred a bit. One of which has some little grooves in it, which tells me as, a, as an anatomist, when I teach anatomy, these are birthmarks. When the pelvis has been pulled apart to, like this, it leaves a little scar on the pelvis, on this, the soft tissue of the pelvis, and it usually indents into the bone a bit. I saw a couple notches on one. That's when I thought, oh, she's had babies, so that was hers. I just, in my mind, quickly thought about it. Dr. Jordan knew that one of the cabinet members who had been executed at the fort was a woman, Jacqueline Kreft. She had a son. So he thought, well, maybe this is her. Then the team found other items mixed up with the remains. We found a few things in there. Clothing, pieces of jewelry, uh, the wallets, uh, stuff like that, watch. To clarify here, the jewelry found among these remains was different from what Sergeant Colin Brathwaite from last episode found when he got to Calabini. No rings were found during the forensic exam. And other reporting we've done suggests that a necklace was mixed in with the remains in the exam, along with that watch that Dr. Jordan just mentioned. Another thing the forensic team saw was a dress, which was partially burned. Dr. Jordan recalls that someone in the lab told them it was the same dress that Jacqueline Kreft had been wearing on the day she was killed. Dr. Jordan also said that inside one of the wallets, he saw what he described as a bill from Bain's hardware store, the business that had been owned by Annie Bain and her husband Norris, the executed minister of housing. There were also items associated with Fitzroy Bain and Evelyn Maitland, two other people executed. All those items, along with the physical remains, they were photographed extensively by the forensic team. And then the exam wrapped up. We started in the morning on the 11th, and it was probably dark when we finished, uh, decided to call it quits. The next day, Dr. Jordan says the remains were picked up by the U.S. military. And that was the end of his time with the forensic team. Dr. Jordan got back to work. He had to help get the university up and running again. And he didn't think much about this unusual experience that he'd had in his lab. Not until years later, when he got curious about that exam and about what came out of it. After the break, what happened when Dr. Jordan went looking for answers? Dr. Jordan knew that there must have been some kind of report or summary that came out of the examination in his lab at SGU. So he wrote to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology and just asked for it. I wrote for it. Somewhere I wrote, I found a uh, address for this guy. It said, is there a report? And um, it was sent to me by mail. Do you remember what your reaction was when you read it? I was a little surprised. Why? Because it didn't match what I thought uh, exactly. I also got a copy of this report. It's just a few pages long, and it's titled 
Consultation Report on the Identification of Remains, Grenada, West Indies. In the top left corner is the seal of the U.S. Department of Defense. And the date, December 12, 1983, one month after the conclusion of the forensic exam. Dr. Jordan was surprised by how short the report was and by some of the details that he felt it had gotten wrong. For example, the report says, quote, we found no identifiable anatomic evidence of female remains. But remember, he had seen grooves on a pelvis. I thought I found a female pelvis. They didn't mention any female pelvises. He didn't understand why that wasn't in there. He also had questions about the top-line takeaway of the report. It says, quote, The material available for examination and the records available for comparison are insufficient to establish the identity of Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, members of his cabinet, or other persons who allegedly died at Fort Rupert, Grenada, on 19th October 1983. In Dr. Jordan's mind, that sort of made sense. He also hadn't seen any definitive signs that Bishop was among those remains. In his mind, the evidence was insufficient. But the cabinet members, he was surprised by that. Remember, he saw that wallet he thought belonged to Norris Bain. He'd seen the dress that he thought belonged to Jacqueline Kreft. To him, there had been enough there to suggest that they could be the remains of the cabinet members. This is all hypothesis. I really don't know. To be clear, there were mentions in the report of female attire and, quote, personal effects. And there's a section describing a couple of attempts to match some limited medical records to the remains. They said these attempts were unsuccessful, and so the remains couldn't be positively identified. But when I read the report, What struck me was how it also leaves some room for doubt. When it talks about having no evidence that Bishop was among the remains, it states that, quote, This does not preclude the possibility that small parts of his remains are among the fragments without unique features. So to me, it sounds a little bit like they're hedging, as if they're saying, We don't think that Bishop's remains are in there, but we can't be totally certain. I was curious what other forensic experts would make of the report now, whether they'd think that there was sufficient evidence in it to point one way or the other on the identity of the remains and what they'd make of the quality of this report. Basically, they said they couldn't tell anything. And, you know, and, and that seems a reasonable, you know, conclusion. But they, they didn't have um, a lot of documentation of why. This is Lowell Levine, a forensic dentist and the retired co-director of operations for the New York State Police Forensic Sciences Unit. Levine said the report itself is so short on details, it was difficult to tell how they were making their determinations. And when it came to the evidence that they were using to eliminate the possibility that Bishop was among the remains, using fragments of bone to determine the maximum height of the bodies was 6'1 and not 6'3— to him, it just seems shaky. You know, stature estimates are so-so. You know, it's just an estimate. You know, and it was only a two-inch difference, so that doesn't mean a lot. We talked to a forensic anthropologist who had a similar reaction. Thomas Holland is the director of the Forensic Institute for Research and Education at Middle Tennessee State University. I would like to have more information about, for instance, there's no inventory on what was found other than in very gross terms. They estimate stature, but they don't tell me what bones they use to estimate the stature. And you can estimate stature from a number of bones. Some are better than others. Some will give you more accurate results than others. So in that regard, that's the reason I would give it a low mark for a report, is they didn't provide any future peer reviewer uh, the necessary information to evaluate it accurately. And he pointed out something else, too. It says in the report that the forensic team never visited the site at Calavini. They weren't allowed to. According to the report and a source we spoke with, they were told that it wasn't secure. According to Thomas Holland, that would have dramatically affected what the forensic experts could say about the remains. I think at the time, you had grave certification teams that were told to go 
dig up some bodies and they they got the big parts. You didn't get the little parts. And they took the big parts to a laboratory because that's what they were told to do or took them to a morgue. That's what they were told to do. I don't think there was the appreciation for the information in all the little parts that get left behind. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It's just um, that's not what they were trained to look for. And this is why you want a, uh, an archaeologist or a forensic anthropologist doing the recovery, because you're left with this question, aren't you? Were there no heads or hands in the pit, or did they simply not recover the fragments of them? And because the recovery was you know, substandard by today's standards, you can't answer that question. Before we go on, I just want to point out that Grenadians who have heard about this report also have a lot of skepticism about it. We know that in 1984, the year after the invasion, an official from the U.S. Embassy sent a letter to the Grenadian government. In it, the official stated that, quote, As far as my government is aware, the remains of Mr. Bishop and his colleagues have never been identified, end quote. The letter also mentioned the exhumation at Calamini and said that, quote, the remains of persons found at Calamini were not identifiable, end quote. The letter didn't make it clear that items belonging to some of the people killed with Bishop had been found among those remains, information that the families of these people say that they would have wanted to know sooner. That didn't come out until almost 20 years later. The Grenadian government launched a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it tried to get to the bottom of what happened to the remains. As part of that, the Grenadian government found and shared the U.S.'s forensic report. A lot of Grenadians think that either this report is inaccurate or something is being kept from them. The Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, the agency that conducted the exam and wrote that forensic report, it no longer exists. There are now three separate entities, the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, the Joint Pathology Center, and the National Museum of Health and Medicine. We've spoken with people at all of them. We submitted all the Freedom of Information Act requests that we could. We were looking for additional photos, notes, records from this exam. They told us that they conducted extensive searches and had, quote, no records responsive to the request. After talking to Dr. Jordan, I was left thinking about the state of the remains and how they became unidentifiable. They were so destroyed that the forensic team couldn't even say for sure how many bodies were in there. They estimated five, not eight. So how did the bodies get like that? And was it intentional? My mind went to the different theories and rumors that are out there. One of the big ones is that the people who killed Bishop and the others are the people who did something to ensure that the remains couldn't be recovered or identified. A lot of Grenadians believe that, including the former prime minister, Keith Mitchell. Well, let me, let me tell you something. I've talked to a lot of friends of mine because I told you I was involved with the revolution members. And I have strong reason to believe that there were elements in the revolution that knew the, where these bodies are. The guys brought the bodies down in, in, down in the south. Calavini, and right? Calavini, and burnt it. And some of them have been said that some of it was thrown, the bones were thrown in waters. Right they told there. you that yes, ele- directly? Elements, elements. Who? So if, no, I wouldn't name anybody because it would not be fair. I cannot say this is true. I cannot tell you. I'm only giving you a, a, a possible scenario. Of, of, um, I, I, and that makes to me a lot more sense um, then. And I think they were worried. Don't forget the extreme left, who uh, then identify as responsible for the death of Bishop and were extremely unpopular, they would have been worried that if Bishop's body was recovered, that there would have been um, probably more difficulty for them. I've heard similar theories from other people too. 
that the murderers may have at some point separated out Maurice Bishop's body and buried him elsewhere. That maybe they'd thrown his remains into the ocean. Or maybe they'd removed the heads of the people in that pit to make them harder to identify. It's pretty horrible to imagine, but those are the accusations that are out there. So it was time to go to them directly, the people convicted for the murder of Maurice Bishop. If you say the Grenada 17 in Grenada, most people know who you're talking about. It's a shorthand for the group of people convicted for the killings of Maurice Bishop and his supporters. Most of them were originally given the death sentence for the killings. But their sentences were commuted, and eventually, through an appeals process and compassionate release, all 17 were allowed to go free. That happened over the course of a decade, between 2000 and 2009. Many of the 17 are still living, but not everyone we reached out to agreed to talk. I've mentioned previously that former Deputy Prime Minister Bernard Cord wouldn't talk with us. Callistus Bernard also turned us down. He was the army officer who oversaw the execution and also was present when bodies were moved to Calabini. We did sit down, though, with somebody else. Someone who was accused of giving the order to execute Bishop and who helped decide what to do with the bodies afterward. Do you want some water? So yes, much. thank you. Yeah. Yes. So you're doing a documentary on Grenada, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're doing... 40 years after? Yeah. My colleagues and I met up with Joseph Lane in the conference room of a resort in Grenada. He had been a senior officer in the People's Revolutionary Army, and he had stood by Bishop's side during the beginning of the revolution. Four and a half years later, he was there for the end of it. I recognize at the time that this is a, a sea change in, 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 terms, in terms of everything. That's, that's what I would say, you know? I, I recognize <clears throat> that life has changed. It's, 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 it's no longer the same. Joseph Lane spent more than two decades in prison for his role in planning the assassination of Maurice Bishop. Today, he lives a pretty normal life in Grenada. He works in the legal field. But there are people who think that he has not taken full responsibility for his role in the events of October 19th, 1983. This situation just came upon us. Right? In a sense, you were, you were, you were making up the, 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 the rules as you go along. The situation just came upon us. He told us that he accepts responsibility for some of the events that led up to the executions. But he insists that he did not play a role in the decision to execute Maurice Bishop and the others. And he says that he doesn't know anything about the final whereabouts of the remains. He's maintained that for years. Several of the family members that we've talked to believe that you and others, uh, the people who went to prison for these murders, that mm. there is more that you have to say about mm. what happened to these bodies. There are details that are important that haven't been, that you haven't shared, that you've kept secret. Well, I mean, I could understand uh, family members, <coughs> the, the, the grief, and I could understand the anger, the hostility, even the hatred. And I don't know what information we could be holding back in terms of what happened to those bodies. I think we have spoken as openly as, as we could. Certainly I've tried to speak as openly as I could. But 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 that's it. I can understand, I can understand however how they how they feel, but I don't know what more I could say with we with regard to that. I asked Joseph Lane to take us through the timeline, to take us from the executions to the removal of the bodies from the fort. The bodies could have stayed there, you know, so what we said was this, uh, <clears throat> maybe the safest place to move the bodies was the Calavini, yeah? But why was the thought to take them to Calavini when, you know, just down the road on either side of the fort, there's one funeral home, there's another funeral home, mm -hmm. um, that that is the natural place where you would take um, someone who's died? The, 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 the core reason for moving the bodies to Calavini was just, if you want to put it, the fear of what would happen, what could happen. It would flame the situation if the bodies were handed over. So the initial reason was to hide the bodies, just until you figure well, out if what you want, If you want to use the word hide, I, would, I don't think this is an unfair uh, uh, description. Yeah, I think that's a fair description. Is there any question about when the Americans or whoever recovered 
remains from that pit. Is there any question about whose bodies those were? Mm -hmm. Were there any other bodies buried, to your knowledge, at Calvini? No. So it's it's no 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 uh, no question in my mind that it's the bodies connected with the events, tragic events on October nineteenth. So every single bone that would have been recovered from that would have, grave would have been connected with, with people from October nineteenth, the folks with uh, with uh, people who died tragically on the fourth. Specifically, Morris Bishop and the others. Morris Bishop and the others, yeah. We moved on then to what happened after the remains were taken to Calabini, whether he or anyone he knew went back out there to do anything further with the bodies, to either damage them further after the fire went out or to remove specific bodies or parts of bodies, something that would account for the strange details that became apparent in the forensic exam. And just to remind you of the timing, there were five whole days between the night of the executions and the start of the U.S. invasion. The killings happened on the 19th of October. The U.S. invades on the 25th. So enough time that the Grenadine soldiers could have returned to Calabini and done something with the bodies. Is there any possibility that some of these bodies, and specifically maybe Maurice Bishop's body, was separated from the group and that something else happened to it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Why not? Well, when, it, when we say possibilities, I mean, <laughs> almost anything is possible, right? But I can't imagine how that could have happened. I raised to Lane a few of the theories I'd heard, all of which he denied. That one of the Grenada 17 could have tampered with the bodies, could have removed heads from the bodies, could have taken Maurice Bishop's body from the pit at Calavini and disposed of it at sea. Just put them on a little boat, take them out in the bay, past Calavini, put it, put it in the ocean and make sure that so that means you have had to go out to sea and all of those things, though? I mean, the ocean's right uh, there. No, I think, I think, I think that's, that's fanciful, to be, to be quite frank. We interviewed Joseph Lane for more than three hours. We also interviewed three others from the Grenada 17. Lester Redhead, Chucky Ventor, and Christopher Stroud. We talked to them for an additional eight hours total. They all said essentially the same things that they said in court, that the bodies were left at Calavini, that they didn't do anything to them after that, and that they had no reason to lie. This is how Christopher Stroud put it to me. What I have to lose now, I have nothing to lose. What, 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 what it could do to me? What, what, what profit is it in me to, 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 if I knew something different, and I'm refusing to tell them. If I knew all those questions, why, why should I keep that to myself? Nah, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The fact of the matter is, there are five days that are hard to account for. That period between when the bodies were placed in the pit and the start of the U.S. invasion. So the morning of October 20th to October 25th. Calavini was relatively isolated at the time. So it's possible that one of the 17, or really anyone else on the island, could have come and tampered with the grave during that period. That's baloney. That's slightly not so. That's Chucky Ventor, one of the 17. There were also photos, I remember, in Newsweek or one of these um, U.S. magazines, you know. With the, with the body the, bag? Yeah, yeah, the body bags and so on. And when you ask him and others from the Grenada 17 about whether they were involved beyond what they've said, their most compelling defense goes something like this. We have always said that we left the bodies in a pit at Calavini. You have seen those photos of the U.S. Army showing up to that pit in Calavini. They found bodies there, exactly where we said we left them. They pulled those bodies out of a grave. And then they said that they didn't have the bodies. So you're saying we're the ones who aren't telling the truth? And I tell people, you know, when I meet them, you know, if whenever the issue comes up, I'll explain to them um, that the U.S. has the bodies. You know, and, you know, at the end of these discussions, people understand, you know. Lester Redhead also one of the 17, put it pretty bluntly. You are American, you know the Americans are good at lying. You know what they do all over the world. You know what the Americans are up to. I mean, come on, they're not going to tell you that just so. I mean, let's face it. 
We heard Lester Redhead. We heard Chalky Ventor. We heard from those other members of the 17. We heard the many other Grenadians who think the U.S. might have something to do with the state of the remains. So that was next for us, to try to account for the two-plus weeks between the start of the invasion and when the remains arrived at Dr. Jordan's anatomy lab. And when we shifted our attention to that part of the timeline, we learned some pretty surprising things about the possible role of the U.S. military. We slept in a graveyard. You know, there were bodies in the dirt, in the ground. That is next time on The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. If you want to read the forensic report that came out of this exam, definitely head to our episode guide. That is where we've compiled documents as well as photos and videos related to our reporting. Check it out at WashingtonPost.com slash Empty Grave. We've also got an email for the podcast where you can share thoughts, questions, reactions. That's at emptygrave at washpost.com. Episode 5 will be out next week on Wednesday, November 15th. But subscribers to The Washington Post can access it on Monday, two days early on Apple Podcasts. If you're already a subscriber to The Post, you can connect your subscription automatically through The Washington Post channel on Apple Podcasts. If you are not yet a Post subscriber, go to WashingtonPost.com slash subscribe or look for the link in our show notes. The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop was reported and produced by me, Martine Powers, along with Ted Muldoon and Rennie Svernovsky. Our editors are Sarah Childress and Bernita Jablonski. Fact-checking by Amelia Schonbeck. Mix editing by Theo Balcom. Our series theme and music is by Kashav Chandradoth Singh. Mixing, sound design, and additional music by Ted Muldoon. Our show art was designed by Lucy Nayland. Publishing support from Allison Michaels and project editing by Casey Schaefer. A special shout out to Nate Jones, the FOIA director here at The Post. And I want to say thank you so much to the listeners who have taken the time to rate and review this show. It is so encouraging to hear reactions from the folks who are listening. So if you haven't yet, leave us a review in your podcast app. It's a great way to help us reach a wider audience. Or even better, share this show with a family member or friend who you think would find it valuable. Thank you so much for listening to The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop, and we will see you next week for Episode 5.